Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our channel. In today's episode, we'll be taking a closer look at the M1 Abrams, the most modern tank currently in service with NATO, standing shoulder to shoulder with other battlefield kings such as the Leopard 2 and Challenger 2. For the first time since the Gulf War in 1991, the Abrams has the opportunity to face off against its heavyweight rivals, the T-72 and T-90 main battle tanks, the most representative examples of the Russian Armored Fighting Vehicle School. In fact, the Abrams is a household name in the world of tanks and is always compared to Russian tanks by Western weapons enthusiasts. However, the debate on which is better, the Abrams or Russian tanks, is still a hot topic. As we have shared about our goal, we do not want to compare these two tanks in a purely theoretical way. Instead, we aim to provide purely factual information about the manufacturer and related events. And now, let's join the American tank king, the M1 Abrams. The M1 Abrams main battle tank is considered one of the heaviest tanks in the world today, weighing nearly 68 tons, but it is also the tank that integrates the most modern NATO technologies. For example, a gas turbine engine, Chobham armor with a uranium core, a high-precision fire control system and safety systems that ensure the survival of the crew when the tank is hit. This tank was developed by Chrysler Defense and is now part of General Dynamics. As shared in the article about the Leopard 2, the M1 Abrams and the German tank share a common origin from the MBT-70 project. After the project ended, the US developed a simplified version called the XM-803, but this project was also quickly cancelled in late 1971. From February 1972, a new tank research group was formed to study the standard requirements for future tanks, of which the safety factor for the combat crew was given top priority, followed by the fire control system and weapons. In terms of weapons at that time, there were three types of guns that were researched and available, including 105mm M68 cannon. This type of cannon has the advantage of being highly mobile, easy to use and relatively cheap ammunition. 110mm British rifled cannon. This type of cannon has more power than the 105mm M68 cannon, but has the disadvantage of being bulky and difficult to transport. 120mm German smoothbore cannon. This type of cannon has the most power of the three types, but has a high cost and is complex to operate. After careful consideration, the US military decided to choose the 105mm M68 cannon. The reason for this decision is because advances in kinetic energy penetrator technology have increased the power of the 105mm M68 cannon to a level comparable to the German 120mm cannon, while still maintaining the advantages of mobility and ease of use. However, by the time of the M1A1 Abrams version, the 105mm M68 cannon had been replaced by the 120mm M256 cannon. This cannon was designed based on the German 120mm cannon, but was simplified for ease of use and maintenance. Initially, the idea of equipping the Abrams with anti-tank missiles was considered. However, this decision was later cancelled. The reason is because advances in fire control systems have increased the accuracy of conventional artillery shells to the same level as missiles. Therefore, it is necessary to correct the information that the Abrams cannot fire missiles. The lack of missiles on the Abrams tank is not due to weakness, but for other reasons. Regarding the initial engine issue, the developers explored two options diesel and gas turbine engines. In 1973, the research team traveled to the UK to learn about the Chobham armor technology on the Challenger 1 and decided to purchase it for the XM815 prototype, which was built from June to December 1973. The XM815 was later officially renamed the XM1 from 1973 to 1976. The project continued to be evaluated during this time, including Germany's participation in the program with the Leopard 2nd Avenue project, which was somewhat technologically superior to the XM1. However, its 25% higher cost than the XM1 made it unappealing. Instead, the US decided to focus more on buying the Leopard's cannon for the XM1. Conversely, Germany considered using a gas turbine engine for the Leopard. On November 12, 1976, the XM1 prototype was selected to fulfill the engineering production contract for 11 pilot vehicles. After resolving the issue of sand and dust clogging the gears of the gas turbine engine, as well as a number of other issues, on May 7, 1979, the contractor received a contract to produce 110 vehicles. In February 1981, the project was elevated to top secret status and officially received a mass production order. A total of over 10,400 units were built, 
with each unit priced at 8.92 million United States dollars in 2016 exchange rates. Initially, it was planned to name the M1 Abrams after General George C. Marshall. However, due to the association with tanks, the name of General Creighton Abrams was chosen, who had commanded the tank battalion of the 4th Armored Division and was the commander of the United States Army. At that time, the new modern tank was officially named the M1 Abrams. Regarding the features of the Abrams, instead of going through each part one by one from the overall procurement overview, we will choose a different content structure. That is to focus on the highlights that are highly regarded and controversial about the Abrams. The first is the M1 Abrams composite armor technology. This is also the one that is often compared the most, who is better and who has better protection when comparing Russia and the US. As is known, the Abrams is a rare tank in the world whose armor technology contains an extremely toxic substance that is considered a banned substance in the world, and the Americans are outraged and demand embargoes and even war against those who possess it. However, the US has put that toxic substance into the armor technology of tanks, which is depleted uranium, also known as depleted uranium, which has a lower U-235 fissile isotope content than natural uranium, most depleted uranium arises as a byproduct of the production of uranium, enriched for use as fuel for nuclear reactors and the production of nuclear weapons. Since the late 1980s production versions, the M1A1HA has been enhanced with depleted uranium armor, also known as DU armor. This type of armor is placed between the two front armor layers of the turret, increasing its ability to resist kinetic energy penetrators. However, its disadvantage is that it is very heavy, about 1.7 times heavier than lead and nearly 3 times heavier than steel, therefore do armor is only prioritized for the front of the vehicle. If it is also attached to the sides of the vehicle, the vehicle will become extremely heavy and difficult to maneuver. The uranium armor plates cannot be bent either, so all Abrams tanks have square turrets. However, the danger is that do armor contains uranium, a radioactive and toxic substance, so the crew is at risk of health problems. Of course, compared to conventional steel armor, do armor has a much higher bullet resistance. However, the exact level is a mystery, and there are no official statistics on the thickness to date, equivalent to homogeneous steel of Abrams tank armor. Based on research on the M1A2 Abrams survivability on the battlefield, some military experts believe that the front of the turret is the most heavily protected area. Thanks to the reinforcement of DU depleted uranium armor plates, this area has an equivalent thickness of 700 to 800 mm against kinetic energy penetrators and 1,300 mm against heat rounds. For comparison, T-72B3 with contact 5 armor has an equivalent thickness of 800 mm against kinetic energy penetrators and 1,180 mm against heat rounds. T-90A 890 mm and 1,250 mm. T-90M 1,200 mm and 1,650 mm. To penetrate the armor in this area, New generation kinetic energy penetrators or Russian Cornet missiles are required. The front hull of the Abrams has an equivalent resistance of 500 to 600 mm against kinetic energy penetrators and 800 mm against heat rounds. Therefore, penetrating this area is not too difficult even with older anti-tank weapons. The sides and rear of the vehicle are the two weakest points of the Abrams. Most common anti-tank weapons such as the RPG-7 and FPG-9 can easily penetrate this area. The roof is also quite thin and is an ideal target for top attack missiles. It is estimated that in the first two years of the Second Iraq War 2003, up to 17 M1 tanks were destroyed and 63 were completely damaged by RPG-7S. According to statistics, up to 55% of M1 tanks were severely damaged or destroyed when hit by PG-7 verse heat rounds on the side, and 70% when hit on the turret roof. The rear armor is even thinner. During the Iraq War in 2003, an M1 was penetrated in the rear by a 25mm cannon round fired from a Bradley, causing the engine to catch fire. Also in the Second Iraq War, the Abrams was also tested against Russia's most powerful anti-tank weapon, the RPG-29. In 2007, a notable event occurred that shook the belief in the impenetrable defense of the M1A2 Abrams tank. On August 5th, an Abrams was hit by an RPG-29 on the side, injuring three soldiers. Less than a month later on September 5th, another Abrams was hit by an RPG-29 directly on the turret, resulting in the deaths of two soldiers. This event served as a wake-up call for the manufacturer General Dynamics. 
From the damage collected on the battlefield, they clearly realized that new solutions were needed to increase the protection capabilities of the PET M1A2 Abrams. Typical examples include tusk upgrade, improved combat effectiveness in urban environments with the addition of cage armor and reactive armor on the sides and rear of the vehicle, increasing resistance to RPG-7 rounds, VLQ-6 soft suppression system. Equipped on some Abrams tanks of the Marines, this system has a similar function to the red eyes of the T-90 tank, jamming and deflecting the path of second-generation anti-tank missiles using wire-guided and infrared homing methods. VLQ-6 system raising the fighting ability with superior vision compared to the T-90 Red Eye system with 250 hours of continuous operation, the VLQ-6 offers a breakthrough with an operating time of up to 400 hours, helping to increase the combat effectiveness of the tank crew. This system allows the tank to deploy multiple devices to increase the range of protection and support observation in all environmental conditions. However, the VLQ-6 also has some limitations to note. This system generates a large amount of infrared radiation, which can affect the eyesight of the user if looking directly at the device within a range of 4 meters, in addition to being equipped with the Israeli Trophy Active Defense System capable of intercepting anti-tank rounds, the Abrams tank also possesses many other layers of protection. The outer layer of protection helps protect against small arms fire, while the inner layer of protection helps protect the crew from explosions and shrapnel. The crew is also fully equipped with NBC protective gear and an automatic fire suppression system. The most notable feature of the Abrams tank compared to Russian and German tanks is the separately designed ammunition compartment, completely isolated from the crew compartment. This significantly increases the crew's survivability in the event of an attack on the tank. The ammunition compartment on the Abrams is located behind the turret, separated from the fighting compartment by a thick steel plate. The ammunition compartment has two steel plates on the roof. When penetrated by an anti-tank round and the ammunition compartment detonates, the explosion will blow off the plates, releasing smoke and fire from the vehicle, minimizing damage to the crew. However, this is only a theoretical assessment. Combat experience has shown that these two steel plates are not enough. Each 120mm round contains 10 kilograms of propellant and a few kilogram of explosives. Just one or two such rounds are enough to blow the turret off the vehicle, let alone save anyone. That is the general assessment of the Abrams armor, very modern and emphasizing safety, but nothing is perfect. Anti-tank weapons have always been ahead of tanks throughout history, and this has been proven. After armor is the firepower of the Abrams. When it comes to the Abrams weapons, it can be said that most of us are impressed with the king of tanks of the US's toxic ammunition, rather than the 105mm rifled or 120mm smoothbore cannon. Indeed, the Abrams has a kinetic energy penetrator that was once considered unique, the ultimate trump card to destroy Russian-Soviet tanks. That is the kinetic energy penetrator using a depleted uranium penetrator, commonly known as Do ammunition. The most popular kinetic energy penetrator today is the Sabo Stabilized Armor Piercing Fin Stabilized Discarding Sabo APFSDS. This type of ammunition is specially designed for anti-tank purposes. The main component of the APFSDS round is a high-strength penetrator, usually made from two main materials, tungsten and uranium. Most tank-producing countries use tungsten penetrators for APFSDS rounds. However, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia are the countries that also use DO depleted uranium ammunition. Russia uses DO ammunition less commonly than the United States. The choice of DO penetrators for the US Abrams tank stems from three outstanding advantages. One self-immolation effect. DO is a heavy metal with a density 2.5 times that of steel and is extremely flammable, similar to magnesium. When the projectile hits the target, the temperature at the point of impact reaches about 1,132 degrees Celsius. During the penetration of the armor, both the projectile and the armor are partially melted due to the extreme temperature and pressure. After penetrating the armor, the unmelted part of the projectile will continue to melt the melted part and debris, causing them to flow into the vehicle's compartment. If these fragments hit the ammunition or fuel, it will cause serious damage to both the vehicle and the crew. Two, Self-sharpening effect when penetrating armor. The dew penetrator can be broken, but the tip still retains its arrowhead shape. Meanwhile, the steel tip will be deformed into a mushroom shape. Therefore, the DU penetrator creates a smaller and deeper hole than a conventional steel penetrator. Additional advantages. Dew penetrators can reduce air resistance, resulting in higher velocity and accuracy than steel penetrators of the same type. In fact, tungsten penetrators also have the above two advantages. 
However, do ammunition is very cheap, almost free for countries with nuclear power plants like the US, as these plants produce a lot of depleted uranium. However, like do armor, do ammunition also has a major disadvantage that it is very toxic, harming both our troops and the enemy. Do has been suspected as a cause of Gulf War syndrome in many US veterans who participated in the first Gulf War in 1991. In this conflict, 85% of US soldiers admitted to using do to engage targets. During the Balkan conflict, NATO soldiers were advised not to consume local water and food, to stay away from areas targeted by do ammunition, and not to pick up suspected do fragments. Currently, the Abrams tank is equipped with five versions of ammunition representing the most advanced do depleted uranium technology. M829, M829, A1, M829, A2, M829, A3, M829, A4, M829, A2 is considered the most effective version, designed to defeat Russian T-72, B3 and T-90A tanks with contact 5 explosive reactive armor. For the more modern T-90M version, Abrams uses the M829A4 round. The specifications of these ammunition types are classified as top secret. In addition to DU penetrator rounds, the Abrams 120mm cannon is also equipped with several other types of ammunition. M830 High Explosive Anti-Tank HEAT, round, designed to destroy enemy tanks. M908 High Explosive HE, round, used to destroy infrastructure and underground facilities. M1028 Canister round, containing 1,150 steel balls, effective against infantry at close range. The cost of this round was approximately $2,000 USD per shell in 2009. The explosive power of an M1028 round is estimated to be able to eliminate over 60% of an infantry platoon. Regarding the fire control system, it is likely integrated with the tank's overall system, similar to the Leopard 2 and Challenger 2. The parameters of the fire control system are highly classified, but it is known to include infrared sighting systems, speed sensors, firing angles, wind direction, and even temperature, with an accuracy rating of approximately 90 to 95 percent. It is capable of detecting targets up to 4,000 meters away. The Gulf War in 1991 clearly demonstrated the superiority of the Abrams tank over Soviet models such as the T-55, T-62, and especially the T-72M. However, it is important to note that Iraq faced numerous disadvantages in this conflict. The T-72M variants they utilized were downgraded versions, lacking in both protective capabilities and fire control systems compared to the T-72A and T-72B models used by the Soviet Union. Therefore, assessing the capability of the T-72 based solely on this conflict may lead to inaccurate conclusions. With superior firepower, especially its ability to engage in nighttime combat, the M1 tank can detect targets up to 1,500 meters away at night, three times farther than the T-72M, 500 meters. During daylight hours, the M1's visibility range also surpasses that of the T-72M, 2,500 meters compared to 2,000M. Thanks to this advantage, the M1 Abrams completely dominated the T-72M in combat. However, the firepower of the T-72M at that time was still limited. The armor-piercing Round 3 BM9 achieved only half the penetration depth compared to the 3 BM44 round equipped on the domestic T-72B. The possibility of using anti-tank missiles for attack was also impractical, as the T-72M was not equipped with compatible systems. Secondly, the vast and barren desert terrain was an advantage for the US military. Iraqi tanks lacked long-range reconnaissance capabilities, rendering the Iraqi Air Force completely ineffective. Although Iraq possessed 1,000 T-72M tanks, this number was inadequate compared to the 1,848 Abrams tanks and the overwhelming air power of the United States. Iraqi soldiers lacked combat experience, were reckless and lacked precise coordination, leading to inevitable outcomes. Their attacks were completely destroyed, for example, the Battle of Median Ridge, two U.S. armored divisions comprising 3,000 vehicles including 348 M1A1 tanks decisively defeated the 2nd Iraqi Army Corps. While the Iraqi Corps had 250 tanks, only about 100 were modern T-72 Mus, with the rest being outdated Chinese Type 69 tanks. As a result, the U.S. lost only four Abrams tanks while destroying 186 tanks and armored vehicles and capturing nearly 1,000 prisoners. On February 27, 1991, the U.S. 7th Corps declared the destruction of 1350 Iraqi tanks, 1224 armored vehicles, and hundreds of anti-aircraft missile units, while only losing 36 armored vehicles, 30 of which were damaged due to friendly fire, 
With the M1 Abrams, only 23 vehicles were damaged, including nine mistakenly hit by friendly fire. It turned out that our friendly fire accuracy was even better than the enemy's accuracy. It's worth noting here that like other Western tank models, the US does not highly prioritize automatic loading systems, instead relying on the fourth crew member. Therefore, the loading speed depends on the physical fitness of the soldier. On average, a healthy soldier can load between four to six rounds per minute. However, during the Battle of 73 Easting in 1991, there was a recorded case of a soldier loading two rounds in just 10 seconds. However, this was an exceptional case. Regarding the engine, the Abrams is equipped with a highly powerful AGT-1500 gas turbine engine with a capacity of 1,500 horsepower. This type of engine is highly regarded for its operational capability and power compared to traditional piston engines. However, it also has some drawbacks such as high fuel consumption, limited range, and the need for additional fuel vehicles for support. According to assessments, the M1A2 variant received by Ukraine is equipped with three fuel tanks with a capacity of 1,680 liters, but can only travel about 350 kilometers. To start the engine, the M1A2 requires 31 liters of JP8 fuel. Therefore, the use of Abrams tanks can be a significant financial burden for countries with limited defense budgets. Despite drawbacks in fuel costs and fuel replenishment issues due to its immense weight, the M1 Abrams remains a formidable war machine. The A1 variant weighs 57 tons, the A2 variant weighs 67 tons, and upgrade packages like the M1 A2 V3 could make it weigh up to 75.8 tons, the heaviest in the world. The AGT-1500 gas turbine engine equipped on the M1 Abrams has a power of 1,500 horsepower, sufficient to operate this colossal machine. However, with such a massive weight, the engine also bears significant pressure. This could negatively impact the engine's lifespan, reduce efficiency, and increase the risk of breakdowns. Additionally, the large weight makes the M1 Abrams prone to collapsing bridges, damaging roads, and facing difficulties in moving on muddy terrain. Fuel consumption is also higher, especially when traversing rugged terrain. However, the speed of the M1 Abrams remains impressive. The A1 variant can reach a maximum speed of 67 km per hour on flat roads and accelerate from 0 to 32 km per hour in just 7 seconds. The strength of the American tank lies in its steering system. Since the M48 model, tank crews have praised this system for being easier to use compared to the Soviet T-54. Even with the M1 variant, the Abrams is still easier to use than the T-72 and T-90. This is a notable advantage of the American tank, alongside operational cost issues. However, using gasoline fuel for Abrams will be a challenge for Ukraine. They not only worry about high maintenance costs but also have to ensure a continuous fuel supply. Moreover, the fact that the US does not provide the do-armored version of Abrams to Ukraine will also affect the tank's protection capability. The US refusal to export Abrams with do-armor stems from safety principles. Abrams has been assessed as the most disappointing tank due to this issue. Especially in the fight against the Islamic State IS. in Iraq in 2014, the Iraqi army, which was supported by the US and equipped with 146 M1A1 tanks without do-armor, suffered heavy losses. Insurgents used outdated weaponry to attack and burn tanks. By the end of 2014, only 40 M1A1 tanks remained operational. To supplement the army, Iraq was forced to urgently import 73 T90S tanks in 2017. Meanwhile, the US only agreed to provide Iraq with do armor less M1 tanks. It should be noted that equipping do armor alone is not enough. Proper tank deployment plays a crucial role. This has been proven in reality. In 2015, the Saudi Arabian army used the M1A2S version, believed to have do armor on the front of the tank's hull. However, they were still severely damaged by the Hothi rebels using outdated Soviet-era faggot anti-tank missiles. Due to the do armor being only on the front of the vehicle, the lack of reactive armor on the sides, coupled with the long and large turret with an ammunition compartment at the rear, has become deadly weaknesses. The situation deteriorated to the point where the Global Security Association once assessed that the M1 Abrams had poorer protection capabilities compared to Russia's T-90 when the M1 Abrams was destroyed by outdated rockets like the RPG-7 Faggot. Meanwhile, as we have seen, to counter the T-90AM, the Ukrainian military had to resort to expensive missiles like the Javelin. Therefore, while Russia promotes its weapons, the United States is not idle either. Selling tanks also requires public relations, that's just how it is. Apart from the US, Australia, Egypt, Iraq, Kuwait, Greece, Saudi Arabia, Morocco and Taiwan have become customers of the Abrams, with Egypt being the largest purchaser with 1,050 tanks, 
making it the second largest owner of Abrams tanks after the US, with a total of 8,100 tanks. In general, experts are eagerly awaiting the upcoming performance of the Abrams to gain a clearer understanding of the Russian and American tank doctrines.